Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Getting to Better Together, our podcast mini-series sponsored by the Centre for International Development, Social Entrepreneurship and Leadership, SIDSL as we are known, of the University of the Sunshine Coast, and I'm your host Richard Borden. Before proceeding, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. During a recent episode in this series that focused on generative artificial intelligence, the point was made that the development of the technologies that support these endeavours, such as those used by chat GPT, raise a host of ethical issues. I tried a little experiment after that comment. I opened up chat GPT and asked the question, what ethical issues are raised by the development of these technologies? The response, which was close to immediate, I have to say, informed me that, quote, generative artificial intelligence raises several ethical issues, including, and it went on to list uh, uh, 10 issues which it identified, which included job displacement, intellectual property, transparency, bias and fairness, and perhaps most disturbingly of all, quote, questions about the moral status and consciousness of AI systems themselves. The question arises then, what are we going to do about these matters as humans? For we're a weird mob when it comes to moral judgment and ethical decisions. We are endowed with the ability to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong, what's good from what's bad, what is just and fair from what is not. We're able to anticipate the future consequences of our actions, as well as having the capacity both in making value judgments about these potential outcomes and choosing alternative courses of action where, upon reflection, these are indicated. And yet, we really seem to call upon these capabilities even when we are confronted with situations that clearly indicate that we ought to do precisely that. As far as matters of ethics and morality are concerned, the vast majority of us seem not to know what we're doing, or more to the point in this context, what we should be doing. We don't even appear to understand or even recognise the moral and ethical dimensions of the more pressing issues that we face. It shouldn't be that difficult. We all have consciences, after all, innate intuitions and feelings that seem to guide us in our judgments about right or wrong, and that they, in turn, urge us into actions. All too often, however, a reliance on conscience alone provides too unreliable, too inconsistent, too biased, and the source of all too frequent conflict between social groupings and within them. They're too unreliable to provide solid foundations for sound judgment. To make matters worse, we can all exhibit perverse tendency to ignore what our inner voice seems to be telling us. Robert Wright, in his delightful 1995 book, The moral animal puts it this way. We are a species splendid in our array of moral equipment, tragic in our propensity to misuse it, and pathetic in the constitutional ignorance of these misuses. So where to from here? My guest today, Declan Humphreys, will help us move forward in our attempts to understand and respond to some of the ethical challenges raised by these emerging technologies. Welcome, Declan. Thank you. Declan is the newly appointed lecturer in cybersecurity at the University of Sunshine Coast, where he's developing research into the ethical design and use of AI. He received his PhD in philosophy from the University of New England with a focus on the ethical impacts of new and emerging technologies. Let me start our conversation with a question about the apparent self-awareness of chat GPT. If it's so smart to be able to recognise the ethical issues that its own development raises, Why can't we just leave it to sort the matter out by itself, given that we seem to be unable or at least unwilling to do so ourselves? (laughs) Thank you, Richard, and thank you for the introduction. Um, You really start with uh, an easy question there to to figure out. Um, Why can't we leave it to ChatGPT or AI to make moral decisions for us? I mean, I guess I want to take a little step back before we go into that to talk about what ethics is or what ethics is to me. Um, You mentioned there that everybody has, I think, the capacity for ethics to think rationally and to think through problems. There's a great quote by um, Oxford professor of AI, John Tassoulis, um, who says, you know, AI isn't an academic discipline. It's really 
the analysis of everyday thought. So if we break it down, I think AI, uh, I think ethics comes down to two simple points. It's what do we owe ourselves and what do we owe to others? Mm -hmm. So really it's self-interested, but then also what do we owe to others? And all ethics and all AI and the implementation of AI, I think has to flow from those bases. And Mm -hmm. from that also is, you know, what's the right thing to do? In terms of AI as moral decision makers, okay, sure, there's a few different schools of thought about morality and ethics, which I think AI could help elucidate. For example, you know, we talk about, I talk about um, cybersecurity is which I, what I teach here and professional ethics. And if you ask AI or you ask ChatGPT, you know, what should I do in this professional circumstance? It can, you know, fairly generally go through a step-by-step of how how ethics is reasoned out, you mm-hmm. know, but perhaps it doesn't go into the analytic detail of, of why or how you can kind of shape these thoughts yourself. So, you know, it might say, well, go to a superior or um, work out a plan with someone. So it's it's giving you an instruction. It's not really giving you right. um, the, the capability or the toolkit, I think, to develop moral thinking yourself. Mm-hmm. So perhaps it can be a little touchstone, but I don't think it's it's capable at the moment or should be relied upon at the moment as, as a moral decision maker. Right. Does reason sit at the base of all of this? Do we actually use our reason in terms of of the classical forms of whether we deduce or whether we induce or do, is that at the base of ethics? Yeah, I mean, reason, sure. There are different schools of um, thought, of moral thought, and one particular school um, puts reason first and foremost. So mm-hmm. this is um, the school that comes from the philosopher Immanuel Kant. Um, the technical term is deontology, which you know focuses on reason alone. So if there's a moral decision, we should be able to use our reason to figure out how to come to a solution. Mm-hmm. You know, reason is the the kind of uh, the driving force behind ethics. There are different schools, though. I mean, another school um, traditionally we talk about is is utilitarianism, which is the school. Um, of thought that places the right and wrong action on on the consequences. So rather than using reason, it's a bit more practical and a bit more mathematical Mm -hmm. in in a sense that you weigh up what the pros of a uh, decision is versus what the cons are. And you you kind of do a mathematical equation and that's where you come to, to right or wrong answers. So depending on the school and depending on your ethical frame of mind, reason either plays a major part or, you know, focusing on this kind of more practical, ethical um, decision making. There's a, there's a big um, debate and, you know, different schools of thought about about how we get to these moral decisions. Just talking about utilitarianism or consequentialism, as I understand it's often called, um, is it possible, do you think, for the GPT to say, that reminds me of, or have you thought about and then provide you options rather than just the instruments of saying how you go about that? Possibly. I mean, that's an interesting point. It, then you're talking about reasoning as in taking different concepts from different areas of, of thought. So to join them together to make a decision, um, which is really, you know, that's it's quite an interesting point about, I mean, that's quite a quality of intelligence, I think, of, of not just reasoning through a mechanical process, X, Y, and Z, but actually intelligence, to me, I think, and to me others, is, is taking in a broad um, broad frame of mind and broad experiences to, to inform a decision. So, yes, in, in a lot of senses, I think that's a very interesting point. And the limitations, then, I think, of, of large language models are their capacity to to bring in these external thoughts and you know to to form form ideas that are from broad um, broad different parts of of um, its knowledge I guess you mm. know that's a that's possibly where where these large language and models are going whether they're at that point now is is definitely up for debate. I remember um, in history lessons many aeons ago when I was at school, we were taught about the Luddite movement. In, uh, which started in, in the Midlands in, in England, where craftsmen, weavers and, and uh, people who were concerned in the cotton trade 
which were essentially home industries, weren't they? Uh, they objected to the mechanization and industrialization, I guess, of the of the process, and went about it by smashing up the machines. Now, in some ways, that creates an ethical dilemma, does it not? That on the one hand, they were protecting their own industries, their own uh, what weren't really well, the home industries, but their own competencies, their own capabilities, in the face of what they saw as owners, mill owners in particular making a profit essentially at their expense. The counter-argument was, ah, yes, but industry is now providing jobs uh, that paid money that weren't there before. So again, to ask the question, is there always a dilemma at the base of an ethical question? That's a really interesting point. Um, the Is there a dilemma? Sure. The You know, the Luddite example is, is definitely apt for the progress of AI at the moment and the unpredictability of where jobs in particular are, are going to lose out and where they're going to be replaced. I mean, no one quite has a crystal ball as to know what jobs are going to be disrupted and how, and then what new jobs are going to replace those. I mean, there's an obvious case that jobs are going to change you know, you know, with AI. I think there was this thought up until perhaps the last one or two years that AI was mainly going to change you know, manual production. It's increasing automation in, in factories, right. for right. example, um, which was known and has been well known for a while. I think now with generative AI, the, the question is, is it taking, what different jobs is it taking? And is it going to replace your know, creative industries and industries where we thought were the domain purely of humanity? You know, I and many others perhaps thought, you know, the last bastion of humanity is, is this creativity where we can use our thoughts to create poems or stories or songs, which now uh, in the light of ChatGPT and other large language models, we've found out actually computers aren't, it isn't that hard. For them to do so really you know there's a lot of movements now necessarily against ai but figuring out what its place is and it is a dilemma i think because it has this social impact but more than that there's this uh, technical progress which i mean technology is always progressing and whether we put guidelines or restrictions on it is is an ethical concern and I, you know, I was reading this morning, I don't know if you remember, about six months ago, there was an open letter signed by uh, many leading members of the AI community, yeah. e Elon Musk, uh, Sam Altman, um, CEO of OpenAI, calling for a moratorium on AI production. And we kind of see what's happened in that last six months. Well, no one stopped. You mm. know, the progress of technology has mm. kept going. People mm. have kept researching AI. And I think what this comes down to when you're talking about ethics is this idea of consequentialism. And the dilemma here is, well, what's the benefit that AI and technology is having and going to have on the future? And is that worse, worth um, kind of the negative impacts and the immediate impacts of, of job loss for, mm. for mm. A, a number of um, sectors? Second to that, I mean, that's one way of looking at the ethical issues. The second to that is, well, can we take in the concerns of of humanity, of the people whose jobs these um, technologies might be replacing? Do we put a bigger value on that or do we put just all the value on the progress of technology and, you know, it's possible pros and, you know, not focus so much on the, the potential negatives that, that will come out of it. So there, there is the dilemma, and it depends how we, how we come at that question with what solution we, we want to have for humanity, I, so, uh, I think, and for, for the progress of, of technology. Which I guess takes me back to my opening paragraphs in terms of that we indeed do have the capacity to think about the consequences, future consequences of our action, but we're not all that good at it. Uh, and if you look historically, anybody who has ever tried to predict gets things incredibly wrong. Like um, I can remember the first CEO of IBM saying the world will never need any more than one computer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Wrong. Uh, and so for me, the issue, there's, there's a weakness itself. Um, and then there's the issue of our, our willingness or, or ableness to, to make decisions. And I have often been critical in my own field within, within agriculture that far too few people think ethically. In other words, think about whether that's right or whether it's wrong. And you mentioned uh, at least two of the, of the number of schools have thought about how you approach them. 
I would suspect that uh, in advance of 90% of the human population have no idea uh, of, if you will call them theories or schools, of how you actually approach, of how you take something like rights. Because the question uh, that arises like, do animals have rights? Uh, do trees have rights? And so on. And it seems to me those are philosophical questions which you as a philosopher will be very comfortable with. But with people who like certainty, that's extraordinarily uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, it is. And I think this is the appeal of, as we talked about, utilitarianism or consequentialism. Ethically, it appears a little bit more black and white. You know, we can balance the cost-benefit analysis. And it's quite common in business decision-making and government decision-making is driven by this, oh, well, let's, what are the pros and what are the cons? And then that's how we get to a solution, really. And it is it is a form of reasoning, but it doesn't take into consideration, like you said, animal rights or, or human rights, for example. It, there is a critique of, of this form of, of reasoning where it doesn't take into account the values of what's at stake. So, you know, how do we put the value of a human life? How do we put the value of um, someone's livelihood, someone's job? How do we put a value on that if we're weighing that against, say, the monetary progress or the, the income that's going to, the revenue that's going to be generated from, from a new or advancing technology? Mm. And I think, you know, talking back to your point at the start, can, can ChatGPT or large language models reason ethically? Okay, they might be able to say, well, here are the pros and cons, let's weigh them up. But can it actually put a, a value judgment on, on what the contents are? You know, can ChatGPT say, well, one human life is worth this, and then so we can weigh that up against it's going to create this more, many more jobs. I don't think um, we want AI to be really doing that because that's quite a human a human form of reasoning and it's a human trait that we do is we put value on 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 things so i think that's really where ai is going to fall down and it's this other type of reasoning that we that a lot of um, philosophers talk about you know it's it's not just this um, cost benefit analysis but you have to take into into consideration the value of of what you're what you're measuring mm. and, you know rights obviously comes into that which leads us to to the notion of virtue does it not I mean, in terms of argument, well, could um, a, a technology of any side have uh, a virtuous side? Can they actually be upstanding citizens, as it were? I mean, I have to say that one of the things that surprised me most about the first time I used GPT, and now the one I've just cited, is the speed at which it responds, which to me immediately suggests that that's a mechanical response. It's not a reason, let me think mm. about that. Or am I being virtuous in stating that? Yeah, when you look at the core of what, what these large language models are, it's it's just putting one word after the other in a way that kind of makes sense. You know, it's reasoning out what the most appropriate word is going to be in a sentence. So whether whether it's really reasoning through anything or it's just saying, well, this is the thing that most makes sense. In terms of virtue, I mean, you, you talk about virtue there, which is a, another school of, of ethical thought where it places what the right and wrong action is on on kind of a, a, a self-development, you know, a moral development where over time, me as a human, I go through my experiences and I learn from them. I learn what is right and what is wrong, what a good person should do. Whether you can train an AI like that is is a completely different question, I think you would need it to you would need to feed in experiences to it but whether you can can a computer be trained through experiences to be a virtuous or do you just program something mathematically like you say can you boil down okay this is what a courageous person is or this is what a beneficent person is can you encode that and then run a program that would just makes all its decisions based on that i don't know whether that whether that's possible is it a topical conversation amongst the AI folk? Encoding virtue or encoding ethics? Yeah, essentially. There are, yeah, there are definitely ways in which people are trying to make AI more moral, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've had instances where large language models, particularly at the beginning of this, this mini revolution, were feeding out criticisms or they were insulting people or they were um, spout you know, 
racist or sexist words which come from their training data you know it's they're trained on large corpuses from the internet so it is there but it's making them more aware of what a moral moral right or wrong output is and i think a large part of that is is this kind of human reinforced learning so this is programming ai um, in terms of rating its output so if it provo- if it provides a racist output this human reinforced learning says no you shouldn't do that and that's how it learns i guess perhaps you could say that's training it to be virtue if you if you're extending it that much but that's really how how a lot of a lot of these models are being trained you know they have a human in the loop who's saying well no that's not a right response this is mm. a more a more right or a more moral response you know trying to limit limit its um limit how it interacts that way for me one of the most uh, as an educator one of the most uh, exciting developments that occurred maybe a hundred years ago was the notion that learning is essentially making sense of our experiences and then trying to figure out what one should do if anything as a result of that experience and it would seem to me that that would immediately deny in terms of, of a technology able to experience. I mean, I can't really imagine meeting a robot on the street and saying, you know, how are things going? What are you experiencing? Yeah, there's a couple of points there. It's I gave a talk the other day about um, reliance and reliance on large language models, um, particularly this reliance on the voice of large language models and not letting them override our individual experience. You know, providing providing stories and creativity, I think, needs this mix of personal reflection and personal experience from the world and, how, you know, where I sit in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. really, this is, it's the spark of a lot of creativity and a lot of writing, which I think, in, in essence, these machines or these large language models don't have. I mean, they're trained on large, large amounts of, of data from different data points, you know, billions of parameters, and they form sentences, but they can't see the world from where I am, you know, and that's how this expression of humanity and human creativity comes from learning from my experience and my experience around and then incorporating that um, to create something new, to create mm. new knowledge, mm. which I don't think these machines can do. I mean, if, if we turn to kind of the realm of science fiction, there is a point where some scientists might be leading towards where, okay, these large language models, they're limited in that they don't have the capacity for, for memory and they can't, you know, plan long term. What if one of the points being made is what if you can put one of these large language models into a kind of simulation? So you can give it a simulation where it can conduct its own experience, right. experiments. So, for example, I mean, like you said, someone who's learning to ride a bike is going to learn much more in five minutes actually getting on and falling off than reading a whole book. So right. perhaps what if an AI was able to do an experiment with gravity, with a ball, be able mm. to drop it or something like that, mm. and then it can learn from that experience. Mm. Then, you know, we're talking about something which can develop its own knowledge and its own reason capacity. It can build on its own knowledge through experience. and. I mean, this is quite dystopian. Is that something that we want it to be able to do? I mean, these mm-hmm. things learn so quickly and, you know, from all the data points. So if we give it more and more information, then, you know, where is it going to stop? And and how do I don't think anybody knows really where that's going to go. It's possibly quite a philosophical question. Where where do we put limits on, on these things? Well, it's also a question of, of law and governance, isn't it? Mm. Somehow or another someone sometime has to make some sort of decision and the people who are actually creating the models knowing the potential consequences are therefore potentially acting unethically or at least amorally they're really not using moral consideration in terms of what it is that they're doing not using moral consideration it's it's difficult to say that it's immoral if we don't quite know the. what did you say amoral amoral sure okay yep (laughs) Um, if if we don't know the circuit, I mean, the argument is well, we don't know until technology gets that far. Right. But uh, whether that's worth, uh, whether we can say that, you know, whether we can just have technology as a driver and technology for technology's sake, and call it amoral, where we don't have to make judgments on it, you know, it's only it's only how people use it, you know, that's one argument. But I, I think. Now we can, there are sparks of where we can see see AI and 
AI going. And every, I mean, every institution around the world and governments now are trying to scramble together to put AI guidelines in place. And obviously the law takes a long time to put these in place. So it is really up to technologists at the moment and then society also to talk about, okay, where do we want these to go and what should we enact into law? Should we see AI, should we put it in the, the realm of, uh, I don't know, biological weapons or chemical weapons where mm -hmm. there, are, there are limits on mm -hmm. what you can and can't do, okay? Mm -hmm. Like you just cannot um, refine uranium in your basement mm -hmm. okay, uh, mm -hmm. or whatever. So are we, are we going to that extreme and can we get to there because of the unpredictability of AI? Uh, should we be putting these restrictions on on now? And you know, we talked earlier about that that letter um, urging people to to take caution and to take a step back. Is the is the kind of I guess the the genie out of the bottle now? There are so many companies focusing and and working in AI. Is it have we already gone past that? Is it too late? Or is are these kind of measures that have been scrambled into place now going to be enough to to stop whatever's in in progress that's it's a big like you say it's a it's a it's a law and it's a practical concern you mentioned uh, of memory and, and imagination um, triggers a, a story in my mind which I, I love about Albert Einstein one of the most uh, intelligent persons ever who was once asked on a train for his ticket and he said uh, oh sorry I don't have it and the guy said, well, that's right, you can buy another one. And he said, but anyway, I know who you are, so don't worry about it. And Einstein said, I do worry. He said, the reason I have a ticket is because it tells me where I have to get off the train. I have a lousy memory, <laughs> but a wonderful imagination. <laughs> I thought maybe that's the essence of humanness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, perhaps. I mean, there's there was a recent story, research that came out out of America where um, Chad GP, uh, GPT-4 um, scored in the top 1% of creativity. You know, it's this um, most widely used scientific creativity test. I think it's called the Torrens Test of Creativity. And it scored in the top 1% purely because it could come up with new ideas that hadn't been, that were kind of out of the ordinary. Um, and it could create, for example, new products or it could create marketing ideas. So, I mean, talking about creativity there and imagination, if something like GPT is trained on so many data points, its ability to kind of take those data points and, and to form something new, it's a form of creativity and I guess a form of imagination, but does that mean that we have to reassess what creativity is? I mean, hmm. a humanness uh, of creativity right? Yeah. or imagination, yeah. And th there's the other point is about, there's a lot being re um, written about uh, um, GPT and large language models capacity to hallucinate, which is to just make make things up. Hmm. Because these large language models want to sound and want to give you the best possible answer, they have the tendency to, to you know, make up things. And, but there's this argument, well, perhaps these large language models like GPT are hallucinating because they're also coded to be creative. Mm -hmm. I mean, creativity, I guess, mm -hmm. is plucking something from the air that wasn't there before, mm. which is, you know, a form of hallucination. So perhaps it's a fine tuning thing where it's we're tuning these things to be creative. But the more creativity we code into it, perhaps the more hallucinations and the more false information that comes out of it as well. It's it's a quite a discussion that's ha being had at the moment. So to sum up the quick answer to the question that I posed is that it's not that we can't just leave AI, generative AI computers to um, sort out the matter themselves, but that we shouldn't. That we shouldn't leave them to, to sort it. out the, the moral issues within yeah. AI? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, that we shouldn't. I mean, there's there's always going to be, there's always going to be points that I don't think AI is going to come up with. And we've seen in the last, I mean, it's probably been almost a year now since um, ChatGPT was, was launched. In that time, more and more ethical issues have come up that humans perhaps didn't think about when we first enacted the uh, first kind of put the ball in motion so more ethical issues are going to come up that you know isn't aren't coded 
into these machines. So yeah, we need to have our own, we need to have a humanness, we ha need to have a reason, we need to bring kind of human, I think human values to, to ethical decision making and, and really putting a value on, on the humanity of, of the, the effect that the decisions that we're using these, these AIs to, to make. Really. I feel reassured. Thank you, Declan. <laughs> that was a delightful conversation. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, and thank you all for listening. I look forward to the next time that we meet and discuss the notion of getting to better together. Until then, goodbye.